Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. We're here today on our Wellness and Weight Loss Wednesday show, where we're going to be going over the five best teas. I was reading an article the other day, and along comes this research by the Cleveland Clinic, who I think do a fantastic job in the overall science and conventional medicine realm. Yes, they are conventionally medicine-based, but they do some really good research. I think the Mayo Clinic does some good research. I think, uh, of course, Harvard Health does some good research. Cleveland Clinic, and, and there are a few other examples of that as well. But what I wanted to share with you was the top five T's that they're recommending that there's really good scientific research on that I absolutely agree with for the most part. And I would just add in a couple of others, which I'd like to do for you here today. So I've done a bunch of podcasts. Uh, all of last year was really dedicated to an herb of the week on Fridays. And so you can always just go back to previous podcasts at stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. And you can literally go over everything, all these herbs, which can be made into herbal teas. So what I want to do is also explain the difference because oftentimes we consider a, a tea, uh, a tea when it's really just a flower or an herb, right? So some of my favorite teas would be something like uh, maybe passion flower or it might be hibiscus, which I love, right? Or even ginger. These are actually not teas at all. We call them teas. We lump them into the category of tea because of how we brew them and put them maybe in a tea bag. And definitely check out my previous podcast on plastics and tea bags. So we'll try to link all these up today at stephencabral.com forward slash 2546. Uh, all of the research and the data will be right there. Uh, but what I want to share with you is this, is that they're actually not teas, they're herbs, right? So we'll call them herbal teas. That's, that's how we're going to classify it. And a tea then would be something like from a green tea or a white tea or a black tea. Tea. But they're pretty much all in the same family. Without me going down a wild rabbit hole today, uh, I'm, I'm happy to do a show on that. If you if you actually care about the the genus or the actual you know lineages of certain herbs and that are specifically considered teas, uh, we won't do that today, right? We can do a separate show on that. What I want to do is try to give you some really great benefit on the best teas that you can use based on certain health issues, based on the science. So let's dive right into that now and uh, let's get started. So the first one is this, and this, I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna start with the best, right? So if you really want a tea that you could say, hey, if I could only drink one tea, right? If I could only drink one tea for the rest of my life, what's it going to be? What's, what's worth it for me to actually brew tea and make it? It's going to be matcha. It's gonna be matcha green tea. So green tea, is a little bit different. So we're taking the young tea leaves and even younger would be the white tea leaves. So super high in antioxidants, the green tea leaves, the green tea is gonna be the EGCG, again, really powerful antioxidant that's been shown to help with um, well, let me get to that in one moment. The matcha, though, is the ground tea leaves. So instead of grinding them up, uh, the tea leaves, like not to a powder, but grind them up and put them in a tea bag and then you can you know, put that sachet inside your hot water, uh, that that's great, right? No doubt about it. But if you're taking the best green tea and you're grinding it down to a fine powder, that's what we call matcha green tea. So what you're getting is truly the leaf ground down into a micronized powder that you're putting in hot water. I'm going to do a follow-up episode next week of how hot should the water be based on the tea because it's actually different. And believe it or not, it's all the way from 140 degrees to about 212 degrees. Um, that's how you should steep different teas. And we'll do that next week. But first, you want to know like, hey, which tea am I going to use? So this episode has to come first. So Matcha green tea, uh, something that my wife loves. I don't love the taste of it. I'm just not a tea guy. I'm really not. And that's why I don't think that you need to do everything, you know, that you hear for your health. Uh, I just, I cannot get into a lot of like tea teas. I'll talk about the herbal ones in just a moment. Uh, but matcha green tea, ceremonial, organic, that is absolutely the best one. Super high antioxidants and certainly the best research behind it in terms of cancer prevention, fighting heart disease, lowering blood pressure, working as an anti-inflammatory, helping with the metabolism and weight loss, and lowering bad cholesterol. Now, when you look at that, you're like, whoa, okay, well, let me think about all of the top causes of mortality, cancer, heart disease, 
high blood pressure. Diabetes isn't in there, but you can actually see there's a, there is research on it for blood sugar. Um, you have it, right? So that that is why when you look at like what is the best overall tea, I have to agree with the Cleveland Clinic. I really do. It's absolutely green tea. Um, and I would just go one step further and I would say it's matcha green tea, ceremonial grade, organic, definitely. And then you can get into shade grown. Like there's all sorts of different things. Um, but I have a whole podcast on matcha. So if you're really into matcha and finding the best one, I'm going to link up that episode at 2546. stephencabral.com forward slash 2546. All right. So that's green tea. It's number one. The rest of these are based now on how they could benefit you. So we're going to look at which one may be best for digestion. So I think that this one could be a little bit of a toss-up, but I'll tell you which one I use in clinical practice the most and which one that I find to be the most helpful for myself as well. So uh, women in my practice might use it for nausea during first trimester of pregnancy. Other people might use it as a digestive aid, you know, after a meal or during a meal as a hot ginger tea. But this is a great Ayurvedic-based herbal tea, right? So it's made from herbal tea from ginger and really helpful in terms of the digestive benefits. It adds more heat and dryness to the stomach. So it helps with that kapha body type or the mucus, the endomorph body type, and also can help with the vata as well in terms of producing heat and improving digestion. So huge fan of that. And, um, and I absolutely recommend it as the best digestive-based aid. Now, I will say that almost any tea can act as a digestive aid because hot water in and of itself can act as a digestive aid. When you add heat to the stomach after a meal, as long as you don't put in too much water, it's going to promote more and better digestion. The stomach should be hot, right? And so if you just mix in a little bit of squeeze of lemon, uh, that can be helpful. And so you can do lemon plus your ginger tea. You can put in a little apple cider vinegar. All of these things work extremely well as digestive aids. All right, the next one that can be used as a digestive aid, but also for lung health, I wanted to mention this, is actually peppermint tea. So peppermint tea, um, it, again, it works for many as a digestive aid. It's not my go-to because it has more cooling properties. So although I think it's great, I do like it. I'm an advocate of it. Some people get huge benefit when they have more of like an acid reflux or an acidic-based stomach. They do much better with a peppermint tea. Again, this is in Cleveland Clinic. Cleveland Clinic does not mention um, a marshmallow tea, but believe it or not, there's an actual marshmallow uh, root tea that can be very, very helpful for a lot of that high heat in the stomach. And in those cases, with acid reflux, some people would get benefit from apple cider vinegar. And those people, though, with histamine acid reflux, they would actually get worse. And so they would do better with a marshmallow or peppermint-based tea. So hopefully that is helpful. Uh, one, of the ones, one of the ones, too, for lung health that is recommended is adding a little bit of turmeric, cinnamon, or ginger for opening up those airways as well. So I, I found that interesting, and, and I don't disagree with that at all, um, especially if, if I had to lend one, it would for sure be ginger again in that regard. Anytime you add turmeric, you are certainly going to, uh, it's going to act as an anti-inflammatory. That's very well proven. And so again, I'm not here today to give you any medical advice, medical treatment plans, medical cures, or medical diagnosis, but this is literally straight off the Cleveland Clinic's website, so I feel at least somewhat comfortable with you sharing this information, uh, even though they're talking about diseases of the body. Okay, so um, this again, a little transition here. Great tea if you're not feeling well, peppermint tea. Agreed. Peppermint tea is really nice. It's, it's actually, so besides it being cooling, it's calming. It's, pa it's a palliative. So it calms down the body and the nervous system. That's one of the amazing things about peppermint tea. Now, at the same time, it's a bit of an adaptogen. So it's, it's calming the nervous system. It's naturally invigorating natural energy, meaning it's not stimulating norepinephrine, adrenaline, et cetera, in the body. So a lot of people feel phenomenal, especially if they're fasting while sick, drinking some of these herbal teas. So I'm a huge advocate if you're not feeling well, ginger tea, huge fan. Now, if you're also not feeling well, peppermint tea, see which one works better for you. Some people, the ginger tea is a little bit too histamine based and it gives them a little bit uh, too many issues drinking that. They get a little heartburn from it, from the, the histamine reaction. Some people do, some people don't, right? So peppermint can be a really nice one alternatively. But if you're not feeling well, I wanted to give you a couple others in the... Um, uh, 
Uh, the Cleveland Clinic recommends them as well. So echinacea tea, I typically never recommend echinacea tea. I always recommend echinacea in a tincture or I recommend echinacea in uh, some type of capsule. So that's t- we're always using it. We think it's phenomenal for boosting TH1 immunity, uh, but we don't usually use that when people aren't feeling sick. Um, they recommend elderberry. Completely agree. Elderberry tea, fantastic. It's a bitter one. Uh, But again, we're typically using uh, elderberry in either a capsule, uh, a lozenger, or a higher dose of it than you would get in tea. So we're typically not recommending those as teas, although we don't disagree. We just recommend a higher dosage when not feeling well, and then doing like ginger or peppermint tea. They mentioned hibiscus for feeling sick. I don't necessarily, that wouldn't be my top choice at all. Hibiscus is one of my very favorite teas, without a doubt. I love iced hibiscus tea or cold hibiscus tea during the summer. One of my absolute favorites. If you've never tried hibiscus tea, uh, it's a family favorite here in the Cabral household. My daughters make themselves hibiscus tea uh, all the time. I love it. I mean, I will drink it anytime, but you know, I'm drinking smoothies, I'm drinking all my other stuff, So, but I do love it, and I, and I will drink hibiscus tea at least a couple times a week, so big fan of that. Uh, they've got another one, and they say the best bedtime tea for them is chamomile, and I would not disagree, without a doubt. I think uh, chamomile is actually the most pleasant tasting uh, bedtime or sleepy time tea, they call it. And the reason is that there are other teas like a valerian, but those are really earthy. So chamomile is earthy, don't get me wrong, <laughs> it is earthy, but valerian roots really earthy. So, you know, it, you have to go easy on that one. There are other ones that are really nice for sleep, and typically they're mixed in. It would be something like passion flower, or maybe some hops in there, or uh, I just talked about valerian, but then there's also lemon balm. Uh, that might be added as well. So these are like mild tranquilizers, they're called. Uh, They can be very helpful. And it's also nice just to sip on something warm uh, before bed. It kind of calms the body, calms the nervous system. So even if you don't drink a lot of it, it can actually have that effect. So I highly recommend that. Um, That is one that I use for years. I don't drink uh, too much chamomile tea. Like I said, I'm not a big tea drinker. And, uh, but it can be very, very helpful for a lot of people. And, and I did use it. And so, again, it can help with the nervous system. It can help with the body. So, again, the, I would experiment. That can be something really, really great. Now, the last one they recommend is a black tea. You know, the key, I just think that you have to be careful with a lot of black teas. And the reason is, is that black tea, yes, it's going to have a lot of antioxidants. There's no doubt about that. But the problem is that it's going to get you more caffeine. And I don't know that people should be drinking black tea with caffeine on top of the coffee that most people are already drinking. So if you were looking to switch for a caffeinated tea, I would actually recommend a green tea. Now, green tea is going to be half the caffeine typically of a black tea. It's around 42 to 44 milligrams or so of caffeine, again, depending on how uh, much green tea is in there, uh, where a typical coffee might be like 140 two milligrams of caffeine for a small, a Starbucks small is 270 milligrams of caffeine. So quite a bit, but without a doubt, these are some of the absolute best ones out there. Keep in mind, herbal teas um, and green tea, typically very high in antioxidants. And then I I should include black tea as well. So when you're looking for high antioxidant teas, uh, all teas pretty much are gonna produce and give you a lot of antioxidants. So they can be very helpful in that regard. Uh, what I just want to add is a couple notables that were not mentioned, and that would be a rooibos tea. So a lot of people looking to get away from coffee will use rooibos, and they'll use that and actually make it into a latte. And so the latte will feel like they're drinking coffee, but they're drinking rooibos, which does not have the caffeine, and you're going to be able to get a lot of that same feel and enjoyment out of that. So that's a, a really big one and a really great one too. And this is one that I typically don't recommend as often, but there's a lot of people that ask me about it, and it is a yerba mate. Now, a yerba mate tea, there's a lot of benefits behind that too, but it is quite high in caffeine. So again, I would only recommend this one if you're someone looking to get in caffeine, but you don't want coffee, but you want a lot of the antioxidant benefits still with tea, and that might be one to look into. So hopefully this was helpful. I'm going to keep it at that for today. But next week, I'm going to do a follow-up show on exactly how long to steep tea. So steeping tea is going to be based on the type of tea that you're using, the leaves that you're using, and also it's going to be based on uh, the time done 
in order to, meaning water temperature and the time it needs to steep. If you oversteep something, it's gonna become very bitter. And uh, if you don't leave it in long enough, it may not open up and give you all of the antioxidants, EGCG, et cetera. So what I would share with you is this. Uh, I'm going to follow up on those, but maybe start to experiment with some of your favorites based on what health-based issue you might be dealing with and if it could be beneficial. So hopefully this was helpful. Tune back in for next week. This was episode 2546 if you want the show notes. And of course, if it was helpful, do feel free to share this with anyone you believe it could serve. Take care, everybody.